Thank you. Yeah, so I'm um, here to talk a little bit more personally about my experience in Peru. Um, as Sitara mentioned, I was in a film uh, that came out in 2016 called The Last Shaman. Some of you uh, may have seen it and may be familiar uh, with uh, that film, which I, I believe is part of my story. But I, the reason I'm here today is I, I feel like I want to talk a little bit more about um, some things that the film didn't capture. I say that the film was part of my story um, because I feel like it was incomplete and I feel like uh, it was not a totally accurate account of my experience in Peru. In the film, uh, I was portrayed in a very triumphant light. Uh, in 2011, I was very sick, I was very desperate, and I was looking for a cure uh, for depression, anxiety, suicidality. And I went to Peru, um, and uh, I was there for 10 months, and the film shows some of my process, and. Uh, after I came back, the film would lead you to believe everything was great. Um, everything was not great, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, in the film, I was shown to be rejuvenated, healed by my encounter with ayahuasca. Um, and I think that this story is a story that I encounter down in Peru a, a lot. Um, it's a version of a common story I encountered among Westerners and a lot of people down uh, in the jungles of the Amazon, which is a story, I think, of unbridled enthusiasm. And certainly there's a lot to be enthusiastic about when it comes to ayahuasca. But I, I do believe sometimes this enthusiasm can lapse into a fantasy about the potential of ayahuasca as a cure-all or a holy grail. And I think those are terms I, I heard thrown around a lot during my time in Peru. Um, and so my concern is that sometimes we approach this medicine with unrealistic expectations. Uh, and my hope today is by sharing my whole story, albeit in a very abbreviated form, um, that I might be able to contribute to a body of stories that's a little bit more realistic. And I also do want to say I'm so grateful for the work um, these doctors and scientists are doing. Uh, I think viewing this treatment, viewing this medicine, viewing shamanism through a lens of empiricism and skepticism uh, is, is something we have to engage with. Uh, as tempting as it might be to lose ourselves completely um, in, in more spiritual conceptualizations of what's happening, I, I think it's important that we approach this with a scientific and empirical mindset as well. Um, so my story, very briefly, is that in 2011 I took a trip to Peru. Um, I was in very bad shape. I had dropped out of college my senior year. Uh, I had spent two months in psychiatric facilities at that time. I had had, I think, a course of electroconvulsive therapy. Um, I was hanging on by a thread. Um, my motivation for going to Peru probably first and foremost was uh, just pure and simply desperation. Um, as unfortunately probably many of you in the audience know, uh, either through personal experience or through the experience of a loved one, uh, one of the most insidious elements of clinical depression is that it erases uh, all feelings of, of hopefulness and, and blinds you to any possibility that there may be, in fact, a way out of the nightmare that you're currently living in. Um, I think in me, this prompted a feeling of of almost fantastical thinking. I needed a miracle, I needed a cure, I needed something almost magical if I were to escape from this situation. At the time, there was a lot of press about ayahuasca. Uh, the article in particular that grabbed my attention was an article in the National Geographic about a woman who had traveled to Peru, I think engaged in one or two ceremonies. She had been dealing with profession, her depression her entire life, and uh, she emerged from that experience in her own words, cured, um, and, and you know, basically ready to, to reassimilate and, and live a happy life. And that sounded really good to me. Uh, and, and that's what I was looking for. So, um, but I thought it could only come through something really, really miraculous. And, and that, in my mind at the time, was ayahuasca. The second motivation, which I think was a little bit more legitimate, was a deep sense in myself that there was a spiritual component to this illness, this experience I was having. And I didn't feel as though this aspect was adequately addressed by medical professionals in the Western medical model back in the United States. Um, 
Over the last 30 years, there's been a trend uh, in psychiatry towards biological explanations of mental illness. Um, I think this is a really positive trend, actually. I have no issue with this. I think um, uh, it would be crazy to deny the role of biology, uh, neurochemistry, in the role of neuro, uh, in the role of mental illness. But to me, it felt like in my interactions with these doctors, there was almost too much of an emphasis on this component, and I thought maybe there was something more going on. I also felt like there was too much of an emphasis on just me as an individual, you know, my problem, this thing that I was carrying around, uh, where I felt deeply um, that this illness was probably an expression of something greater than myself, maybe a disequilibrium within my family, within the culture I was raised in, and within, you know, the greater maybe human species um, in the 21st century. Um, and I, I felt like that shamanism, um, as it's practiced in its various forms around the world, actually spoke to this uh, this perception of illness much more than the medical model um, that I was being exposed to back in the United States. Part of, I think, what inspired this feeling in me that this was a problem beyond just the individual was at this time of internal, when I was internally crumbling, you know, I was looking out at the world and also seeing a world that was crumbling. I was seeing the mass die-off of millions of species, uh, global warming. I, I saw, you know, human beings living in a fundamental disequilibrium with the, their environment. Um, and I felt like this sort of greater sickness, I think, and this violence being inflected on the world, I, I felt deeply was being reflected in, in my own body. It, it was, it was a felt sense. It was not something I could maybe rationalize or explain it beyond that, but it, it felt very um, true to me. And again, this sort of discussion didn't seem to be arising in the discussions I was having with doctors. So in my mind, to merely treat this illness, to you know, come at it pharmacologically, try to minimize the symptoms, it felt to me like I was rejecting a call to maybe see the world from a different perspective and to obtain a perspective that wouldn't only benefit me, uh, but the community around me. Uh, and this is a well-known pattern among uh, hu humanity for millennia. Um, we've seen, again, in, in the shamanic tradition across various cultures that when someone gets sick, it's common that a healer comes, takes them, they go off alone, and they interact with uh, spirits, if you want to use that word, or they're un unconscious. There's a confrontation uh, with something perhaps ineffable, ineffable and mysterious. Uh, and returning home from that experience, they arrive transformed to the community as a healer or a leader for whom the illness was a gift, albeit maybe a terrible gift, something, you know, I don't want to minimize how painful illness can be. I don't want to romanticize it. It, it, it is, uh, you know, for anyone who's been through depression, we know it's not, it is probably one of the worst things you can imagine. But nevertheless, it may contain a a hidden secret or a gift, or it may be a call to learn something about oneself. And so this was, I think, actually probably the main driving force why I went to Peru. I probably still can't fully understand it, and I couldn't understand it at the time, but it was something I felt deep inside of me. And so arriving in Peru um, uh, towards the end of 2011, I decided I was going to be there for about a year. And I spent 10 months there. Um, some of which was captured in this film. I participated in weeks and months of dietas, um, probably 40 or 50 ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, I lost 20 kilos. It was an intense experience. Uh, and after all of that, after 10 months, uh, nearly a year, uh, there was no sign of any improvement in my symptoms. Um, I was still suicidal. I was still highly anxious. I felt dissociated as though there was a glass wall separating me from the rest of the world and also cutting me off from my emotions. If you were going down a, a checklist, a, a, a medical checklist, you would say this treatment would have failed me. But I don't think that that is the entire story. Um, if you ask me if that 
time in Peru is a waste of time, I would, I would respond to you, absolutely not. Uh, during the time down there, I had experiences that I didn't know were possible. I had intense visions, um, encounters with dreams and, and, and uh, entities, um, and many of which reassured me that I was on the right path, whatever that path was. Many of these images showed me uh, drowning in a sea and being extricated and placed on, on land. Um, another one, I saw myself surrounded by demons in a, a kind of hellscape, and I was coming and ascending out of that. And probably in one of my most reassuring visions, I, I met a woman who kind of softly patted me on the shoulder and said, you're, you're going to be okay. So leaving Peru, it's true, my symptoms hadn't dissipated, but I felt a conviction that I was going to be okay, and that something was playing out inside of me, which I still, uh, frankly, don't fully understand. Um, but I wasn't healed, and I think, and I think that uh, this film and many of the stories you hear about ayahuasca would have you believe, you know, these radical transformations happen in a moment, in a ceremony, in two ceremonies, uh, and that wasn't the case for me. Coming back to the U.S., life was, life was still difficult. I ended up in the hospital uh, one more time. Uh, and for a period of two years, I, I ended back on antidepressants, um, which, which helped me immensely, actually. They had not been helpful before my trip to Peru, um, but I found something that was, that was very helpful upon coming back to the United States. Um, and I think as one of our panelists here mentioned, you know, I, I was forced to kind of re-engage in the world, uh, to socialize. I had spent so much time by myself, which I think was valuable, um, but, but part of it, part of my getting better coming back from Peru was that I had to learn to talk to people again. Um, and there were other, you know, very unsexy solutions I had to put in place. I had to exercise every single day. You know, I, basic, simple things were um, very valuable in my recovery. Um, and I think sometimes that's just something I want to stress because I feel like as a Westerner, I had not been exposed to this sort of spiritual dimension of illness. And once I was, I kind of, it took me a while to come back to maybe more conventional and pragmatic um, elements that also contribute and are necessary to healing. Um, but after I came back to Peru, I, I did notice a change, and that, that change fundamentally was a change in the types of relationships I sought out. Um, I started gravitating towards people uh, I would call healers, though not necessarily professionally, uh, people who listened well, people who taught me to be compassionate towards myself and patient with myself. These were friendships, romances, uh, you know, with people maybe I previously wouldn't have interacted with. Um, you know, prior to Peru, I was very fixated, I think, on external, um, external accomplishment, uh, building a resume, you know, being impressive, uh, and it wasn't serving me anymore. And I think both the experience of being ill, where you can't actually sustain, I think in some ways what amounts to a facade, and also the experience I had in Peru, spending time with myself, in some ways almost recalibrated like my internal GPS and I started interacting with people in a different way and creating a different community about myself. And I think fundamentally, this was probably, uh, you know, over years actually what did help me get better. Uh, and looking back, I think Peru and ayahuasca and this, uh, you know, kind of shamanic experience was very much the beginning of the journey, even though at the outset I expected it to be, you know, the beginning and the end, which it wasn't. Um, so I think, Part of the promise of this medicine is that in destabilizing you a little bit, showing you a different perspective, um, it may introduce you to a larger community, a different community, a different way of relating to people, and that a lot of the benefits of this medicine come after the ceremony. In my case, it took, it took many years, and I'm so grateful to be able to tell you I'm doing so much better uh, today. That was a very dark time in my life, and it seems very far away. Um, and Peru is certainly an element of that, but the, the, I think ayahuasca, you know, as, as we sometimes hear, can produce rapid and impressive therapeutic 
effects in the course of a ceremony. But this shouldn't be the only, um, I don't believe this should be the only thing we focus on when we're talking about ayahuasca. Um, I think in shifting subtly the way we interact with the world um, and maybe bringing us into contact with like-minded people in a community like this, that's where uh, much of the healing we're all looking for, I think, can take place. So thank you. Thank you.